Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Birch from Consult Hyperion, and I'm here to talk for a few minutes about digital identity infrastructure, and in particular about an aspect of digital identity infrastructure, which I think doesn't get enough attention, which is that if we're going to try to construct uh, an infrastructure for the future, you know, one, one of my constant complaints about the lack of progress in digital identity infrastructure is that we've spent a lot of time essentially trying to digitize, to make electronic versions of the analog systems that we already have. We, we try to make a digital driver's license by just making a digitized version of the existing driving license and so on. And if we're looking forward and we're trying to construct an infrastructure from the new economy, which is going to mean uh, you know, real efficiency, but with all the other things we want from that, security and privacy and reliability and so on, I think maybe we should start from a different place and start thinking about what should a digital identity infrastructure do? Um, you know, not, 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 not what has identity done in the past, but what should a digital identity do in the future? And I've drawn up a little list of things here. I've drawn up a little list of things that need to have a digital identity. And so we have to think about digital identity infrastructure that will work for all of those things. So, and I just want to take you through this so that when you're listening to other people talking about digital identity, you, you can just begin to, to sort of think, well, you know, do, does this solve all of the problems? Is this a good way of providing these different kinds of identity? So at a very high level, we can divide the, so there are things that need digital identity this is my very high level view. And uh, and we can divide the things that need identity into two different categories. And that's things that exist and things that don't exist. And what I mean by things that don't exist is, I mean, I'm sure you've all read Harari, Sapiens, you know, it's, he makes this sort of very, in, you know, he's a very interesting narrative for, for our evolution. And he says, you know, there was a remark, you know, there's a really important moment in human evolution where we, we began to talk to each other about things that didn't exist and you know one of the examples of things he uses is things that don't exist is a company you know a company doesn't a company is a legal fiction you know it's you know a company is not a thing in the real world a company is a it's a legal concept um about some stuff in the real world you know there is, and, and so there are things that exist like people, and there are things that don't exist like companies. And that's that's a useful initial distinction. So if we look at things that if we look at things that exist first, we can divide those into living things and non-living things. I mean I suppose we could add viruses as a sort of special category given current circumstances, but I think that's that's probably a that's probably a, a level of detail we don't need for this discussion. So if we just think for a moment, we've got we've we've got living things and we've got non-living things. And if we think about living things, I mean for the purposes of digital identity, we can broadly speaking divide those into two. So living things are basically people or or not people, animals essentially. So we can have we can have living things that are people and living things that are not people. You can already see that living things that are people are a subset of the overall things that need digital identity attached to them. And I don't really want to talk about digital identity for people because, you know, we, we all we all understand that topic. And, you know, we understand the complexity. Well, I'm not sure if everybody does, but, you know, there are complexities to that topic which make it difficult. It's it's hard to make good digital identity because you need digital identity that works for the the ninety nine percent run of the mill cases, which is you logging in to access your bank account or something. But it's all got to, it's also got to work for the hard cases. Like, how does that digital identity infrastructure work for you know the witness protection scheme? How does it work for whistleblowers and all this? I don't want to get into this. Uh, but another example of, of living things that, that would need identities are animals. Why would animals need identities? Well, I mean, our cats have identities. They've got, they've got chips in them already, which, which um, identify them. But, you know, we need a more sophisticated infrastructure because uh, I'll give you an example of wh why this is an economically important thing. Farm animals. I happened to be on a panel a little while ago talking about some some i was i was chairing a panel actually to do with the ethics of ai 
but uh, there were some people on the panel that had different AI use cases. And one of those was farm animals. And in, in the particular case in point, they were talking about pigs in China. There's about 700 million pigs in China. And, uh, you know, in order to sort of maximize productivity, you want to make sure each pig gets the right food and if it gets the right medicine, if it's sick and all that sort of thing. But there's a problem with the bully pigs. The bully pigs come and push the other pigs out of the way and take their food. So, uh, so farmers in China use a face recognition system. JD is uh, China's second biggest e-commerce company and they provide this system. So, uh, so when the pig comes through, the system recognizes the pig's face and dispenses the right amount of food. And if a bully pig comes in instead, he doesn't get the food, he, he, he passes through. And I was just reading the other day actually about uh, they're trialing a, um, in uh, Scotland, they're, they're working on some face recognition stuff for cows. Um, you know, to make sure that, that uh, again, it's a similar kind of thing. You know, you've got a whole bunch of cows in a field. How do you know which one, I suppose, how do you know which ones are your cows? I mean, I'm not really an expert on cows, so I couldn't tell. And to be completely honest, cows, all, they look pretty similar to me. So I, I don't really, the face recognition must be pretty good, I would have thought, to, to do all this. But anyway, the point is, there's an economic reason, there's a business reason, there's a society reason for wanting to recognize animals. And then you want to set up uh, you know, reputational structures and so on. I mean, who, what's the relationship? Who did this animal belong to? These animals, all this, all you know, this kind of thing. So, so there's an example. So, so people need identities. Animals need identities. If you look at the other category of things that exist, which is things that aren't alive, um, I would again draw. I mean, again, this is just for sort of high level thinking. I would tend to think about those things in two categories as well. So of the non-living things that need identities, there's things that, uh, for example, like cars, um, and there's things, you know, which might be you know, more private um, appliances of one form or another. So, so and if you take cars as the example, because that's an example everybody uses. So when, you, when people are thinking about, you know, infrastructure in the future, they imagine that, you know, sort of smart infrastructure, you know, my, my car negotiates for its own parking space and pays for the freeway and this sort of thing. And, and you know, my car, you know, when I drive around to your house, you know, it knows that it's my car. So it lets me into the garage and this sort of thing. And that's all, that's easy when you draw it on a whiteboard. You know, it's easy when you draw it in a cloud. But as soon as you go down one level, well, how does how does how does your garage know that it's my car? How does your garage know that I gave no. How does your garage know that you gave my car permission to go into your garage? How does your car know that that permission is still valid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Once you go down a level, it's easy to talk about the Internet of Things and identification, but it, there's nothing there. Um, and to construct an infrastructure that can work across both of these domains so that I can have identity, my cat can have an identity, my car can have an identity, my garage can have an identity, my toaster can have an identity. It's actually quite complicated. There are obvious constraints. For example, there's a mismatch of economic incentives. The people that make my toaster couldn't care less if it's secure or not. It's not a selling point. I don't care if my toaster's, you know, if my toaster goes online when I'm not around and decides it's going to try and bring down Bank of America or something in cahoots with, with uh, agents of foreign powers. I don't really care. There's an economic mismatch. So unless we're going to start putting powerful cryptographic chips in toasters, which is not obvious to me, despite the recent House bill about improving security in the IoT, I think we have to look at different structures, what people talk about, about edge systems. So, you know, there's a there's a there's something in my house which manages these devices in my house. And that's what interfaces to the outside world. But again, you know, if you bring the refrigerator into my house, like how does it get the identity of me as opposed to the identity of the manufacturer? And, there's nothing there. You, you can draw it as clouds, but there's nothing underneath it. If we look at things that don't exist, uh, I think, uh, again, we'll look at sort of two categories here. So of the things that don't exist, I think we should think about identities for things like companies, I mean, things that don't exist, but are legal entities. Company identity is a, is a particular pro I mean. Uh, not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but I happen to be on the advisory board of a company up in Boston called Payment Works, which is doing fantastic work in this in this area because the identity of companies is just as important as the identity of people. 
figuring out who, whether it's a real company and you know did they really send this invoice did they really sign up that sort of thing so there are things that don't exist but but have legal entities companies and we need to work out identities for that and of course the relationship between these identities i mean one of the one of the interesting you know big pieces of news big pieces of news to people like me in the uk last week was the government's review into company registrations at, at the moment there's an awful lot of companies in the uk whose board of directors comprises you know m mouse d duck you know superman because there's no identity verification and clearly, in a kind of orderly and, and properly functioning society, you need to be able to determine the beneficial owners of companies, and they need to be real people. And actually, even if they could just tell whether it's a real person who's a company director, that would be a massive step forward, um, which is something they share in common with internet dating companies, actually. So I wonder if some sort of, I wonder if some sort of solution can't be found that, that works for both of them. Uh, so there are things that don't exist, but are legal entities, companies. But there are things that don't exist that are not legal entities, which desperately need identity. And, and an example of that would be bots. One of the one of the tragedies of our age is uh, social media, and the fact that you know people are on social media and they're being fed stories and in, in, engaging in interaction and and with things that not only are they not even real, you don't even know who's behind them, who's controlling them. I mean, it would be really nice to be able to set my Facebook feed to say, I only want to see posts from real people. I don't want to see anything from bots. And I only want to see posts from real people who are, you know, in the USA, for example, or something like that, or, or people that are on my whitelist or something, I don't know. But the fact that, you know, my, my Twitter feed could be, is full of, you know, you know, I, I'd, I'd like an option which just says, you know, only show me things from real people. Never mind the sort of blue tick thing. I don't care if it's really Dave Birch. I just need to know it's a person. I just need to know it's not a bot feeding me all this stuff. So we need an identity infrastructure that can handle things that exist and things that don't exist, living things and non-living things, legal entities and things that aren't legal entities, and work and interoperate in such a way that we can construct an economy and in fact a society a healthy society where these things can interact so uh do we have the building blocks to make that possible well i think i think we probably do i'm i'm not sure what some of the other people here would think i mean it's one of the discussions we can have during the event but i think that the sort of underlying technology we need to make that work uh you know the cryptography is in place. In fact, I go further than that. I would say the cryptography that we already have can do some amazing things. I, I, call, I call it counterintuitive cryptography because the things that you can do with cryptographic blinding, homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs are amazing. And people don't think about them because they don't have any analog in conventional things. You, you know, there is no equivalent of cryptographic blinding in the physical world. So people don't think about blinding as an option. But the truth of the matter is that there are many ways that we can actually deliver better services by using those new cryptographic techniques. So uh, all things considered, we've got these four categories of things to think about. But I'm optimistic about the way forward because I think that the technology we have available to us now can actually deliver better solutions than people might think are possible. Thanks very much for listening.